Okay. Uh, so welcome everyone uh, to the 11th CRM PIMS Probability Summer School uh, sequence of summer schools launched uh, at UBC by PIMS in 2004 uh, and occurring not quite yearly, but um, close to yearly um, between then and now. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be um, involved in organizing and lecturing at um, this incarnation of the summer school. Uh, these events were very formative for me as a student, um, junior researcher in probability, and I hope that um, they'll be uh, both um, pleasurable and informative for all of you. Uh, we uh, have about uh, 150 or 160 people signed up this year at various career stages. Um, obviously the format is a little bit different from previous um, in-person schools. One of the advantages of that is we can reach a broad audience across the world, um, whereas we were previously limited in capacity by the um, physical space and the logistics of hosting people at UBC or in Montreal or in Washington, the various places that the summer schools have occurred in the past. Um, but it's a, it's a great pleasure to be wel welcoming you all and I hope to get to know you better over the course of the month. Uh, there are two main courses delivered by uh, Jean-Christophe Mourin and myself, as well as two mini courses delivered by Sarah Pennington in week two and Kavita Ramanan in week three. Uh, I hope that you'll, um, you'll um, attend as much of those as you can. Um, there uh, is various information about the summer school on the course website. Um, both Jean-Christophe and I have um, notes in various stages of completion, and there are links to those notes if you want to uh, take a look at the material that we're presenting in our courses. Uh, I've also made a course website with exercises for um, some of the students who are either taking the course for credit at McGill uh, or um, are attending through MSRI, uh, who, ha who have uh, um, sort of regularly scheduled exercise sessions, and I've emailed you all about that. There are uh, also um, uh, some students who, or some participants who've indicated interest in working on uh, exercises in, in groups with other participants, and I've uh, emailed sort of provisional um, uh, groups to you, trying to keep students um, in uh, similar time zones working together so that um, you can uh, manage to schedule your um, group work efficiently. If anyone's interested in uh, participating in those sorts of group exercise sessions but hasn't signed up yet, send me an email at the um, summer school email address, which is uh, uh, summer school at math.quebec. Um, and I'll write that in the chat as well. Uh, that is a legitimate email address. Quebec is a valid domain ending, um, in case um, you're confused by that. Uh, great. Um, the videos are all being recorded and um, will be posted um, publicly and are also being streamed uh, live on YouTube. Uh, so if you don't wish uh, to be recorded, then uh, we ask that you turn your video off and, uh, and don't use audio. If you, uh, you are welcome to use those things, but if you don't want to be recorded, that's fair warning. Uh, I think that was all. Oh, one more thing. Um, we'll shortly send out a demographic survey uh, for participants. This is important for the funders of the school. Um, so I'd really appreciate it if uh, you could all fill it out and I will periodically bother you about that. Um, last year, um, some of the organizers of this school as well as some of the people organized the online open probability school. Uh, uh, we had great turnout for that. About 800 people signed up for the mailing list, maybe 850. Um, and we only got about 80 people filling out the response survey. Um, so that was kind of disappointing. I'm hoping that we'll get a higher percentage uh, response uh, to this year's demographic survey. Okay, with that out of the way, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Jean-Christophe Mouha, uh, who's an associate professor at NYU on leave from CNRS, um, who is lecturing from France and will tell us about mean field disordered systems. And I'm very excited for his course. 
Thank you so much for agreeing to lecture Jean-Christophe and I'm just going to spotlight you uh, for your lecture. Thank you very much. So let me start to share my screen just to make sure things work. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and, and most importantly, thank you very much for inviting me. I, I really appreciate enormously to uh, be given this chance and I'll do my best to be uh, worthy of that chance. Um, so yeah, as uh, Luigi just said, um, there is a material relevant to the course on the, the summer schools website and also on, like you can also find it uh, through my personal webpage if you want. So yeah, this includes uh, handwritten notes uh, that I wrote down to, to prepare the class, um, the, pro the problem sets, and also the slides I'm, I'm writing during the class, I will put uh, uh, in there as well. And there's also, um, there are also people who volunteer to write transcripts for the lectures and to possibly also write solutions for the problem sets. And you can view this, uh, like there is also a link to, so that you can view the current status of this document. All right, so, so let me now start with the actual content of the class. So yeah, the title is Mean Field Disordered Systems, a PD Approach. Uh, in some sense, the, for me, the, the long-term goal of uh, this course and more generally is to uh, make progress on our understanding of spin glasses. And I say long-term, both in terms of how the, the class will be structured uh, uh, for, for these four weeks, because we will talk about many other things or many other models before we talk about spin glasses. And also it's long-term in the in a broader sense, in the more research sense, because at present, uh, you know, the results I would like to obtain are not yet uh, there, so I only have partial results concerning spin glasses. So it's, uh, you know, it's also long term in some uh, much more longer time frame. Um, and so, so just to clarify, first of all, what spin glasses are, let me introduce the possibly the, the simplest model of a spin glass, which is called the SK model. So SK stands for Shrington and Kirkpatrick, uh, the physicists who introduced the model. Um, so one way to think about this model is to imagine that you have n people, which we can label as using the integers from one to n, and you want to create two groups out of these people. Uh, so maybe there will, uh, there will be a group uh, uh, of plus ones and a group of minus ones. So in order to represent the assignment into two groups, you can, it suffices to uh, reveal a, a vector of plus one and minus one uh, of length n. Okay, so I'm going to write sigma for, for this vector and okay, this is shorthand, like this uh, plus minus one is shorthand for one comma minus one. So if I give you this vector of plus ones and minus ones, it, it prescribes uh, for us uh, an assignment of this group of people, of this set of people into two groups. And in the, in the description of the problem, you're also given um, parameters j, i, j. So for each i and j between one and n, you're given this coefficient j, i, j. And um, okay, so let me, j, i, j characterizes the, the quality of the interaction between individuals i and j. By this, I mean that if, if j i j is positive and large, it means that i and j really get along well together. They would like to be in the same group. While if j i j is negative and maybe very negative, then it means that i and j dislike each other and they would really rather be in different groups. Okay, and, and for, for the purpose of this model, I'm going to assume that these coefficients are independent and identically distributed given by standard Gaussians. Okay, so assume, J I J are independent standard gases. Okay, so 
Okay, and now you have you have a, a well-defined optimization problem uh, that you can try to solve because you want to find this assignment. You have your objective function, which is to maximize overall happiness, and you know overall happiness means that you want to maximize uh, the following function. So for each configuration sigma, we are going to compute the sum over all pairs of j i j times the indicator function that individual i and individual j are in the same group, which we can write as the indicator function that sigma i is equal to sigma j. Okay, so, so this is the object that we would like to maximize so that we uh, discover the assignment into two groups, which is uh, maximizing uh, overall happiness. And equivalently, so for, okay, for a bunch of different reasons I'm going to explain later, it's people usually prefer to write the following function, which corresponds to the same optimization problem. So instead of writing this in the color function, people like to write uh, sigma i, sigma j, just a product of sigma i and sigma j. Okay, so if i is equal to j, this indicator function is equal to one, and this product is equal to one, and if it's not the case, then the integral function is equal to zero, while the product is equal to minus one. So you see that there is a clear correspondence between the two optimization problems. So with that loss of generality, you can decide you focus on optimizing the second function. Again, it's more customary to, to do this uh, in the setting of spin glasses. So I'm going to actually focus on, uh, on this function. Oh yeah, and uh, I'm seeing that there's some activity in the chat. So uh, because I was perhaps uh, a bit stressed out for the beginning of, the, of this conversation, I, I did not pay attention, but normally, I try to keep an eye on the chat, so feel free to uh, um, to write things there. And uh, yeah, like uh, Omer and other people have already answered the question, so I'm not going to comment very much. But yeah, I, I'll, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat. So yeah, really feel free to to write questions. Okay, so is the thing clear so far? So J and J are independent standard Gaussians. And I'm wondering if I can maximize the function that is uh, on display uh, on the last line of the slide. Yeah, so, so the difference between the two functions is a, is a constant. I mean, there's not depend on sigma. So if you optimize one function, you the, the sigma which realizes the maximum for one function is the same as for the other. And in fact, also the values of the function, they are not the same, but uh, it's very easy to understand one from the other. I think the you go from one to the other by just computing the sum of the JIJs and maybe there's a factor of two or so, but it's, uh, it's quite uh, straightforward. Okay. All right, so, so why is this question not obvious? The reason is that the JIJs have, uh, can be positive or negative. So well, the consequence of this is that even if you have a very simple situation with just three sites, the following can happen. So let's say this is site I, site J, and site K. And you know, they have, you know, there are pairs uh, between each of these points. And let's suppose that the J, I, J here is positive. So you would like that I and J be in the same group. And maybe uh, this coupling, the capital J between uh, J and K is also positive. So you would also like these two guys to be in the same group. But it so happens that the, the, the interaction between I and K is negative. And so in fact, you would want these two guys to not be in the same group. It's, it's kind of clear that you cannot reconcile all of these constraints uh, at the same time. Right? So you have to make a trade-off. And in fact, if I just give you the signs of these uh, interactions, you cannot know what is even the best thing you can do. Okay? So, so it's not obvious uh, what is the best assignment for sigma. So you see if the JIJs were all positive, for instance, we could decide that we put everyone in the same group and this maximizes uh, overall happiness. But, uh, but because uh, you know, some want to be in different groups, this does not happen. So, so in general, uh, we can call this frustrations. So, so there will be 
in general, some pairs which maybe you know they are in the same group but they would like not to, or or they are not in the same group and they would like to be in the same group. So even at the optimum, um, such things will typically happen. Okay, so so the frustration is an inherent part of the problem, and really, uh, in my opinion, frustrations is really what should define what a glassy object is. Okay, so each time you 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 look at some object that you try to optimize, and you have these complicated constraints that make it difficult to discover the optimum. Um, you can you can think of this as as being a glassy material. Okay, so so that's that's where the word glass comes from. Um, so you know, if if you think in terms of progressively trying to discover the optimum, then you see that sometimes in order to reach a better configuration, you'll have to make changes that will at first look uh, detrimental to you. you know, there, there's no easy step-by-step -step way for you to discover the optimum. And, and this really, even more than having random interactions, this really is what Classy means. Okay, and, and while I'm at that, um, in the title, there was also a mean field. And mean field means that the, the geometry of the set of units that we look at is very simple. So here it's the simplest possible because every unit interacts with every other unit. Okay, so there is basically no geometry. And so instead of saying uh, uh, no geometry, we say mean field. Okay, well, that's uh, at least a uh, uh, small chart. Here. All right. And so just before I, I continue to describe this problem of finding the optimum of this function, I want to extend this question a little bit. So instead of only focusing about on, on the maximum, I also want to discuss, let's, let's call them soft versions of the maximum. So also uh, soft max. What do I mean by this? So I want to look at, um, the following object. So, yeah, I'm putting some normalization. I'm going to sum over all configurations. This exponential of, of this uh, function, I, I'm going to soon call, start to call it the energy function. Okay, this mapping uh, over there. This mapping here, that which uh, to each sigma associates the sum of j, j sigma, i sigma j, I'm, calling, I'm going to call this the energy function. And, and so, yeah, I want to look at the sum over all configurations, all sigmas of the exponential of this energy. And you see in the exponential, I put some one over square root of n. So I'm not going to explain, but this just, just you know, take it uh, for, for true for now. Um, this makes it so that in the exponential, typically the, the, the object is of order n. Okay, so, so if you do that, then uh, as you slide this parameter beta, you can interpolate between, okay, there's some very easy case when beta equals zero, you're just uh, summing over all configurations. This is really not looking at the energy function. And, and when beta becomes very, very large, on the other hand, this sum will be essentially completely uh, carried by uh, the few terms which maximize your energy function. Okay, and, and so we, we can use this beta to interpolate between problems which are uh, more or less uh, concentrated around the few configurations that reach the maximum. So you know, for very large beta, you can think of it as a, a soft or smooth version of taking the maximum function. Okay, and I want to understand uh, this behavior in the limit when n becomes very large. So I told you that the object in the exponential is over the n. So if I want this object to um, stabilize as n goes to infinity, um, it seems reasonable to take the logarithm and then divide by n. Okay, so that now this should be over the one. And also, if you pay attention, you see that this object is still random, right? It depends on these Jij's here, which uh, are standard Gaussians. But in fact, the fluctuations of this object are very small. So you, should, you can just uh, stop to think about this. And 
I'm going to take the expectation so that we, we don't worry about, uh, about these fluctuations. Okay, and so, so the question I want to ask is what is the behavior of this when S n goes to infinity? Uh, and uh, this I'm going to call the free energy. So it's, you know, there are some, uh, I introduced this problem as some purely optimization problem, but there are connections with physics. And for this reason, this object is often called free energy, or at least uh, I will call it that way. Yeah, so, so the question is, what is the limit when n goes to infinity of this object? And <clears throat> the surprising thing is that it's actually um, a very difficult question to answer. I say it's surprising because the, the question we ask, at least in my mind, is relatively simple. I mean, I introduced this maybe somewhat more complicated version with this exponential, et cetera. But in terms of the maximum, it's, it's really relatively modest. No? We, we, we take these independent Gaussians, we look at the sum of j, j sigma, i sigma, j, and, and we try to, to look for the, for the maximum. Um, so, so just to answer the, the question in the chat, the thing is that the, the j, i, j's are centered, they have mean zero. So you should not think that the sum is of order n squared. Okay, it's um, there will be stochastic constellations because of the uh, because the JIJs are centered and, and of mean zero. And moreover, I would like the exponential what is inside the exponential to be of order n. And the reason is that you know when I sum over sigmas, there are two to the n uh, terms. So so I want the the cardinality of the sum to be roughly on par with the this exponential here. So so you see this. Two to the n, I want it to be balanced with some exponential of something of order n. Okay, so I don't explain completely why this is the right normalization, but at least uh, you know it kind of uh, ballparks what you want to achieve. All right, and so yeah, I was saying that the surprising thing is that the answer to this question is, is actually complicated. And it was uh, predicted in, uh, by a physicist uh, named Giorgio Parisi in 1979. So what, what he predicted is the limit of this object as n goes to infinity. So proposes a formula. For this limit. And in fact, um, when, when Parisi proposed this formula, initially, even within the physics community, it was actually relatively controversial that the, this proposal was, was correct. And I'm not going to fully write down what the formula is, but I'm just going to write the beginning of it. So it starts by saying that it's an infimum over the set of probability measures of a certain functional. And I'm not, I'm not going to write down what is the functional, but... Uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, immediately intuitive, let's just say. And part of the reason why physicists found that very surprising is that um, it's, it's quite well known. And I, I saw someone in the chat mention large deviations at some point. Um, and I think the comment I'm going to do is related to this. It's well known that expressions of this sort, you can rewrite as supremum over probability measures. So physicists would, would think of this as some um, energy entropy optimization problem. Uh, if you like to think about large deviations, you, you can think that there's this sigma, which you can think of as uh, independent Bernoulli variant variables, plus or minus one. And maybe you're trying to find a strategy for the sigmas uh, to maximize this quantity. And you know, this strategy could be described by a probability measures, by a probability measure describing what you want sigma to do, and then you would try to take the supremum over these probability measures. Anyway, um, whether or not what I just said makes sense to you, it's not very important. But what is important, or what I just want to underline here is that it's very natural to write the expression here, this free energy as a supremum over probability measures. But what Parisi proposed instead as a limit is an infimum over probability measures. So, so that's what part of the reason why the, the formula was initially surprising and to some extent controversial. 
But over time, uh, physicists uh, understood more and more of this, uh, of this picture of, of Paris's proposal and ultimately were convinced that it was in fact correct, despite this initial surprise. Uh, and later mathematicians uh, put a final confirmation to this because they actually proved that this formula is correct. So this came uh, in uh, several stages. So first, uh, Guerra uh, proved one bound between you know, the limit and this uh, infimum formula. And then Talagran proved uh, the converse bound. So then the, the full proof was obtained in 2006, shortly afterwards. And then uh, another very interesting development came that uh, Dmitry Panchenko um, uh, generalized this result to uh, uh, a much broader class of models. And also arguably gave a, a more conceptual proof of the result. So, so that's, that's all very nice. And the overarching goal of, of the course is to describe my attempt to understand uh, models which go beyond uh, this, uh, this class. And one, um, yeah, so, so first of all, I have to say, as I already said earlier, this is not yet um, a complete theory. I only have partial results so far. So it's uh, research in the making, let's say. But uh, I thought it would be interesting to speak about research in the making, because if you at some point want to join, then it's nice to know that uh, there are many things to, that remain to discover in this area. And just I'm going to, instead of trying to discuss general classes of models, I'm going to single out one model, which I believe is interesting, and for which I do not know how to answer the, the similar question. Yes, and this model is, is a, a bipartite version of the model I just described. So, so let's say, let me write that the course aims in particular at understanding the following The, the bipartite version of this model. So what does it mean? Um, in, in the model, in this SK model we discussed, each unit interacts with each, with any other unit. In the bipartite version, on the other hand, the units will be organized on two layers and we will have only on interactions only between one layer and the other layer. So you can uh, think of a picture of this sort. Here are some units, let's say there are n of them, and then there are uh, further n more of them the below. And these couplings J i J's, they are going to only go from one layer to the other layer, like this. Okay, I, I cannot draw all of the links, but uh, you get the idea. Yes, so the, the main point is that links like this are not uh, present. Okay, so, so if you want a, a more formal definition, you can think that in this bipartite version, the the configuration is represented by two components, so each in uh, Rn, so it's in Rn cross Rn. And the energy function will be sum of Jij sigma 1i sigma 2j. Okay, so over all i and j between 1 and n. Okay, and again, JIJ here are independent standard gases. And to my surprise, at least at first, uh, I realized that for this relatively modest modification of the original model, uh, we do not know how to identify the corresponding um, free energy or the, or the maximum of this function, if you want. at least in, in this limit of n going to infinity. 
And yeah, so uh, my, my goal is to present um, steps towards uh, uh, an answer to this question. Yes, yes. Uh, so there's a question in the chat about whether or not uh, the sigmas are plus one or minus one. That, that's true, yeah. So I wrote Rn cross Rn because you could imagine uh, um, like uh, using this as a, a function defined everywhere, but then you try to optimize it over uh, plus or minus one to the n cross plus or minus one to the n. Yes, yes, thanks for this, this question. And more generally, maybe you want to um, consider other reference measures, let's say, but let's stick to plus or minus one to the n. All right, um, so maybe at this stage, you wonder why you should uh, be interested in this question. So, so I'll try to uh, discuss why I find this question interesting. Well, the first thing is that um, here I described the model, a model with two layers, but in fact, as I said, uh, I think either we succeed in describing this free energy for this specific model, and then all other models in, in a much broader class will be covered, or just nothing works. So to be more precise, if you like to put more layers into your model, let's say 15 or 100, then you know, the same mathematical problems are present. So, and okay, that's the first remark. And secondly, you know, having elementary units put into many layers is uh, fairly popular these days in machine learning and yeah, when, when you try to do machine learning or when you do neural networks. And you know, I do not claim that this is immediately to be going to be relevant for um, neural network questions, but at least it seems to be um, a reasonable question to ask to know what a typical neural network, one where the, these weights would be taken at random, uh, is doing. So, or at least maybe if I uh, put it the other way, if I cannot even answer the question of what happens when the when these weights are just chosen randomly and without any correlation, then perhaps uh, you know there's not much hope to do uh, more sophisticated questions. So that, that's one motivation. Um, another motivation is that there are yeah, so this is one model among several, and uh, I could describe other model problems which have similar features. Uh, for instance, one which is also very easy to describe is if you decide that you do intersections of random half, half spaces. Um, okay, so, so just before I move to that, I see another question in the chat about what is the structure of the connections uh, between uh, particles in different layers. Yes, yeah, so I, I put uh, connections between. So it has to retain, the, the geometry has to remain relatively simple. Okay, by which I mean, maybe there are a few types and then the, the graph of connectivities only depends on, on the type of your unit. So let's say you're allowed a finite number of types, let's say five, I don't know, and uh, you know, each uh, each type describes one layer, and then you can you can prescribe that each item in of type five is connected to each item of type four, and then each item of type four is connected to items of type five and three. Things like uh, like this are allowed, okay. but uh, not uh, you're not allowed to put things on the grid, for instance. Okay, like if you if you want to create a model on ZD, then I have nothing to say about this uh, this model. Does that clarify the question? Okay, so so yes, I, I was I was trying to describe other models. So so another uh, model which is easy to describe uh, in words is if you take intersection of random half spaces that go through the origin. So so you just pick a random direction. You you that that defines for you a half space, and and then you take another one at random, and then another one, and another one, and you continue like this, and. If the dimension is n and you take a number of half spaces proportional to n, you can ask 
you know, first of all, is the set empty? And if it's not empty, what's the volume fraction that it occupies? And it turns out that this question is very similar to, to these uh, spin glass uh, problems that, that we're discussing here. So other problems in computer science uh, are, are called uh, constraint satisfaction problems. Maybe I won't take too much time to describe this. Uh, maybe if you've heard of uh, the Hopfield model, uh, it's also, in fact, extremely close to, to this uh, two-layer model that is described here. In fact, you can, yeah, like if you look at the marginal on one layer, it's basically a Hopfield model. And the Hopfield model is, is, a, is a model for memory storage and retrieval. Other motivations include the statistical inference, and, and this uh, we are going to to talk about uh, much more in the class. So yeah, stay tuned. Uh, I'm going to explain more about statistical inference uh, in, in a short way. Okay, so that was one question you could ask. Another question you can ask is, why should we focus on, on this specific question of computing the free energy? Okay, why, why should I want to compute this quantity? And my answer to this question is that I believe that this is the, the simplest thing you can, uh, you should try to do uh, when you start to look into the problem. Like, I believe that if you want, again, to put things uh, the other way around, if you do not manage to compute this limit, I believe you're going to be extremely limited in your ability to say anything about the problem. So, you know, that's kind of a belief I have, let's say, uh, but, uh, and you can disagree with this and surely, it cannot be true in a literal sense. There are plenty of things one can say uh, without talking about the free energy, but I believe it's the, let's say it's some sort of a, a threshold that we need to pass. And once we, we manage to pass it, maybe it, it, it opens a, a possibilities for, for further explorations. So maybe one way to think about this uh, free energy is that it gives you some analytically convenient way to probe the geometry of the of the landscape of this energy function maybe you know it's by sliding this beta it gives you some way to try to describe in some analysis sense um, the geometry of of this energy landscape and perhaps uh, one would find more interesting to describe the behavior of um, concrete optimization algorithms on this landscape. So you know, at the beginning, I, I, I described an optimization problem. I was like, okay, I'm trying to maximize this function. And so far, I only discuss theoretical uh, questions like what is the optimum, but I do not discuss how do we find the optimum? And maybe you find this question more concrete because you think, this is what I really want to understand. In practice, I want to know how to find the optimum in these complicated landscapes. And my claim here is that um, I think it will be a necessary first step for you to understand this free energy. And at least for, for those models we already understand, like the SK model, this has uh, been true indeed, that if you want to understand good optimization algorithms uh, for, the, for this SK model for this problem I introduced at the beginning, you have to rely on your understanding of, of the free energy. So I'm not going to discuss further uh, these optimization problems for spin glasses, but uh, I think it's useful to keep in mind that uh, understanding the free energy can be useful also for quote unquote practical purposes. All right, so, um, Maybe uh, other questions so far? Maybe uh, I'm thinking that maybe it would be a good time for a break. Uh, I think uh, having a little break in the middle would be nice. Other questions so far? Ah, yes. So, so there's a question about the, whether the, these JIJs, I said there are, they are Gaussian, uh, standard Gaussians. And the question is, can we take other distributions than Gaussian? And the answer is yes. And in fact, um, compared with the question that I just discussed, it, it's, it's more accessible to show in advance that the free energy will not change if you replace JIJ by other random variables, which are also centered and have the same variance. 
So, so in fact, the really important assumption is, is that expectation of JIJ is zero and the variance is, is one. And maybe you know they have sufficiently many finite moments. I forgot how many, but maybe three is probably enough, maybe four. <laughs> I think three should be enough. So so before before you manage to compute the free energy, you can show that uh, you know any model which comes with these random variables which are independent and have mean zero uh, variance one will 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 converge to the same free energy as the one with the Gaussians. So it's convenient to show this first, and then we can say, okay, now we are done. Uh, we can focus on, on, the, on the Gaussian case. Ah, yes. Um, so, so there's a, a question about, okay, so first I, uh, so, so why the free energy like this? Yeah, I, I only briefly, uh, kind of gave some imp impressionistic view, but uh, I claim it's a, it's a good way to to scan your energy function if you want, like to try to explore it. You know, when, when beta is very large, uh, this is about this is really talking about the maxima of your energy function. When beta is very small, it's also an easy quantity to understand in some sense because. You know, when you sum over the sigmas, basically all of the terms contribute. So it's like you know the the underlying. Like if you think of of these sigmas as being weighted by these exponentials, you can think of this as a probability measure proportional to these exponentials. Basically, this probability measure is uniform over all configurations, so it's also kind of easier to understand. And then you know, hopefully, by some sort of um, maybe analog of a renormalization argument. You can hope that by sliding the beta, you're going to, you know, move from this small beta zone where you understand things relatively easy, easily, progressively towards a large beta zone where things become uh, perhaps more interesting but also more difficult. Um, yes. So, so the, the choice of scale I did not fully explain, but uh, maybe I can try to explain better now. So. I think initially, um, like, uh, let, let's take it for granted that I want this quantity to be over the n. And but when I say over the n, I mean for a typical, you know, for, for one of these terms which really contribute to the sum. So let's say, for instance, I, I look at this quantity. Um, I, I look at the maximum over sigma of this quantity in the exponential. And I want to make sure it's over the n. So, okay, so maybe let me scroll down uh, for a second. So I'm asking what is the behavior of this maximum over sigma uh, of, uh, of sum of jij, sigma i, sigma j. So, you know, so, so here I'm just asking in terms of what's the right power of n. So it's, it's n to some power and what is the power? And it's not super difficult, but uh, it's not super easy either to answer this question. So, so I'm going to uh, change the question into something easier to, to answer, if you don't mind. Um, so, so imagine instead that I'm trying to answer the question of what's the behavior of the maximum over all of these of, um, of E sigma, where, okay, so I should say, for, for each choice of, the, of your sigma, this sum, so it's a sum over n squared terms. Um, so this is a Gaussian, and its variance. Okay, I have to. So each term has variance one, and I sum over n squared. So so its variance is n squared. Okay. So so. So here I'm going to multiply by n and then think that, that these are uh, IID Gaussians, uh, standard Gaussians. So I, I'm ignoring correlations just as a first guess, let's say. So you know, they are not the same problem, but just as a first guess, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm trying to understand how this behaves. So if you think 
that you have two to the n independent standard Gaussians and you look at the maximum, then this is not too hard to show that the order of magnitude is square root of n. So it's, it's new, E sigma are just new random variables uh, which are independent standard Gaussians, okay, which I, I'm just using as some toy problem which I think about uh, in, my, you know, in, in my head before answering the true question. Okay, so, so E sigma are independent standard Gaussians. And I'm asking myself, what's the behavior of this maximum? So I claim that this is of order n to the three halves. Because there's, there's one n here. And then when you look at the, the maximum of k standard Gaussians, this behaves like square root of log k. OK, I mean, this is a, you know, this you can, you can do. Uh, this is an easy exercise. OK, so, so if you ignore correlations in, the, in this first question here, then the answer should be also uh, n to the two thirds. Uh, sorry, three halves. Okay. Okay, I feel like I, I, I confuse people. So I'm asking myself what's the behavior of the maximum of the energy function. The free energy is, uh, is containing this term in some sense, right? Like, uh, the free energy is this object here. Oops. But it, it, in particular, it contains the, the sigma which realizes the maximum, right? And so you see that by dividing by square root of n, I make sure that for the specific choice of sigma which realizes the maximum, what's, what is inside the exponential is over the n. Does that make sense? I did not fully justify it, but I tried to justify it a little bit more than before. And you know, today is introduction day, so I, I don't want to go too much into rigorous proofs. But um, you know, then you, you can try to do a first moment, second moment argument. You know, I, I gave an argument that ignores correlations between the between these JIJs, between these between these, sorry. This is a maximum over a lot of random variables, and they are correlated, and I'm ignoring these correlations. So, so you can make a first moment, second moment argument that shows that indeed the order of magnitude is n to the three halves, but I'm not going to do it right now. I, 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 does that make sense or uh, please say something in the chat if it makes sense. Okay, good. Okay, so, so by, by dividing mass power of n, I make sure that for the maximum and maybe you know, the second maximum also, like the, the first few biggest terms, the, the quantity is over the n. Okay. The, the JIJs are independent, but then when I ask about the, the behavior of the maximum over all sigmas, you know, if I think of each of these random variables as indexed by sigma, by this, by this vector, then you know, if, if I change sigma to tau, let's say these two things will, will have correlations, right? Because you use the same jij uh, random variables to define the two terms, okay? So as I vary the sigma, these have correlations. But as an analogy, you know, because I want to give a quick explanation, I, I replace this by a maximum over independent random variables. All right. Okay, so maybe uh, we'll take uh, two, two more minutes of break for, for real, and then uh, we, I, I will resume uh, the conversation. Ah, yes, yeah. so, so Luigi gave in the chat uh, a lower bound thing, and uh, the argument I gave, you can, you, can, you can show that comparing with something which has no correlations uh, gives you an upper bound all the time. So, so in fact, uh, okay, so you have to justify what I just said, but that, that's true. And, uh, and then you, you, have, uh, you have the two bounds. Thanks, Luigi.
Yeah, another question uh, in the chat is if we if we don't care so much about the JIJs uh, being Gaussian or other distributions, why don't we use um, discrete random variables like plus one and minus one uh, with priority one half? That's a fair question indeed, but uh, it turns out convenient to use Gaussians um, because yeah, you see later, but we we want to use um, something which is a little bit similar to Ito's formulas, or it will come in the form of Gaussian integration by parts. And these are somewhat harder to see with the discrete uh, random, random variables. So it's analytically more convenient to, to use the Gaussians. Maybe one, one way to understand this is that, um, you see, I want to, in fact, instead of, you know, I wrote this beta in front of the sum of jij sigma sigma j. But in truth, very quickly, I'm going to want to, uh, instead of writing beta, I, I will want to write square root of t. And, and then you see that you have this square root of t times the Gaussian, and this evokes Borgia motion. And, you know, we, we're not using really Borgia motion uh, encoding per se, but all the things you can do with Borgia motion, we'll be able to do also um, with these Gaussians because uh, after all, uh, you know, square root of t times a Gaussian is some Borgia motion. It's relevant because we really are interested in trying to slide this parameter t from, from low to, to high. So you know, in particular, we will want to differentiate in t and, and so you, know, you will have nice uh, Ito type formulas uh, when you use Gaussians. All right, so, so let me uh, continue. So as I said, the, the, the spin glass thing is it's possibly my main motivation, but in fact, it will come only quite late in, in the course. And uh, before we talk about spin glasses per se, we will be busy with two other models. Or two other classes of models, I should say. The, the first one is the, the curly bias model. So you, you can obtain it from the SK model by simply setting uh, JIJ to be equal to one uh, instead of the Gaussians. So, so here it's no longer a centered variable, but it's, uh, there's no longer this effect of um, the JIJ being of varying sign, for instance. So, so in particular for this problem, Finding the maximum is very easy. You just set all the sigmas to be equal to plus one. But uh, computing the free energy is, okay, at least uh, slightly less easy, but also not so, so difficult. Um, and we will also study generalizations of this model. So this one is really our our training ground. You know, we're not. It's not. Uh, it's nowhere near being uh, uh, near the frontier of research, but uh, but it will be extremely useful for us to develop powerful techniques uh, to deal with later models. So that's one model or class of models, and and the second class will be models that come from statistical inference. So inference means that uh, you you try to you observe a, a noisy signal and you try to infer or recover the signal. So in particular, we will uh, we will follow we will focus on the following problem. Uh, we consider following problem. So we have a, a vector x bar of independent and identically distributed random variables, which we are going to only observe. So we only observe, we observe 
a noisy version of of x bar x bar transpose. Okay, so this is a matrix. Uh, maybe explicitly, it writes x bar. Oops, x bar i, x bar j. Okay, so so let's just say you you observe this matrix plus noise, and noise is like uh, on each coordinate there's a bit of noise. Okay, so so you observe this noisy thing, and you try to recover uh, that that thing. Okay, so you you observe a noisy version of x bar x bar transpose and you try to recover x bar x bar transpose okay so we try to recover x bar x bar transpose and in fact we will see that there is a very interesting phenomenon uh, similar to uh, things we will observe for curry bias and also later for spin glasses is that there is a phase transition in the problem so what that means is that uh, what we will show is that when the signal to noise ratio is low, so meaning there's a lot of noise in your problem, basically you can, you know, in the limit of large n, you can recover essentially no information about your signal. So I will make this more precise later, but in some very precise sense, you cannot recover any useful information about the signal. By the signal, I mean this vector x bar. And then at some point, when this signal to noise ratio passes a threshold, suddenly you, you, you start to, it's, it starts to be possible to actually recover meaningful information about the scene. And we will uh, you know, nail down where this threshold is. And you know, it's not just uh, in terms of the power of N, like we will say, you know, at the right scaling, this, this transition happens for signal to noise ratio equals one or you know, uh, 0 0.3 or you know, we will give a, an exact characterization of this threshold. And also when we are past the, th the threshold, we will identify exactly how much of the signal we can recover. And so, so that will be the questions that are of interest uh, to us. So this is a more contemporary research. And um, this, this problem of recovering this this matrix x bar x bar transpose, um, you can it has it has links with other problems which uh, you can think of as community detection, for instance. So community detection is the situation in which um, you have uh, again two groups of people, but you don't know their identities, and it it so happens that you know maybe you know, there, there's still the group plus one and the group minus one. And they form connections between each other, and but they prefer to form connections between members of the same group. So maybe with probability, uh, you know, something they let's say uh, point one, uh, they they want to be friends with people uh, within that group, and with probability point oh five, they want to be friends with probability with, with people from the other group, and you only observe the connections. Uh, and not uh, you know who belongs to which group, and you ask yourself, can you recover uh, what the groups are? So, so the, these two questions are in fact very similar, as as I will explain uh, during the lecture. There are, there are also connections. So this is you know this matrix x bar x bar transpose is a matrix of rank one, and in general you can discuss low rank uh, matrices of of a similar structure, and this. This also uh, has um, connections with recommendation systems problems, and of course, you know, it would not be there if it if it had no connections with spin glasses. So I already used this analogy with these uh, groups um, belongings, both for talking about SK and for this community detection here, and it's not a coincidence. So there is a maybe it's not immediately obvious here, but there is a connection between this question I'm asking and the SK model introduced earlier. And in some sense, uh, this, this question of recovering th this matrix of rank one is a, a simpler setting in which uh, you can, again, uh, train your skills, uh, maybe uh, with the hope of discussing spin glasses later. Um, yes. 
And, and, and so we have three classes of models uh, in our hands now. We have uh, query bias, we have statistical inference, and we have spin glasses, which I introduced at the beginning. And what's interesting is that for these three classes of models, I will want to approach the question of uh, studying the asymptotic behavior using the exact same technique, which is this technique based on partial differential equations. So um, let me write this. These three, oops. These three classes of problems. will all be analyzed using uh, certain partial differential equations. Okay, from, from now on, I'm going to write PDEs whenever I need to write this. So, so more precisely, in all of these problems, we, we will um, identify something like a free energy. And I will want to relate the limit of this free energy to the solution of the partial differential equation. Okay, so we want, we will relate the limit free energy with the solution of an equation which has the following form. Okay, so, so here the function is, so it's f of t and x, and t is a non-negative, and x is just a, a real parameter. And it, it's, it's quite striking that in fact for the three models that I singled out, like SK model, curry vice, and the statistical inference thing, in fact, the, basically the same equation shows up well, with a little twist for spin glasses, but it's almost, uh, almost the same for the, three, for the three problems. And, and this will, uh, will make us, uh, will bring us to uh, some sort of a detour towards uh, discussing these specific partial differential equations. So these equations are called Hamilton Jacobi equations. And you see that if my purpose is to say that the limit for energy is the solution of this problem, it would be very important for me to uh, clarify um, what it means to be a solution of this equation, and in particular to have a good uniqueness theory, you know, like you know, something that tells me the yes, with some with, sorry, so I see in the chat a question about the initial condition. So, so with some initial condition, which will be clear uh, given the context. So, so the boundary condition here is only at time zero, right? So it is only the initial condition. And it's true that uh, if you have a more advanced understanding, you, you, you perhaps know in advance that uh, in some problems there will be a boundary condition, but it will be of Neumann type. Uh, but okay, I'm not going to speak about this now. And, and and so we will have to understand uh, how to say, you know, how to speak about solutions of these equations and how to say in particular that, how to identify in particular uniqueness for this, for these problems. Okay, because after all, what we want to show is that something that I'm going to argue is almost a solution to this problem converges to the solution. And this is only more difficult than saying that two things that are solutions are the same function. Okay. So it will be important for us to understand um, how to say there is a unique solution to this equation. And, and this will, will rely on, on the notion of viscosity solutions to this equation. Yes. So I want to clarify from the onset that I do not assume that you know in advance anything about this. Okay, so, so the, the course I aim it to be self-contained in terms of uh, your knowledge of partial differential equations. Of course, if you know already some in advance, it will be helpful, but I do not assume that you, that you know things in advance on viscosity solutions. Also, yeah, I have to apologize for 
writing that uh, something with the Rademacher, Rademacher uh, theorem as a prerequisite. In fact, it, this theorem will, will not uh, show up in, in the lectures. So if you haven't uh, struggled with this theorem, uh, great for you. If you have, I so, I'm sorry, this will not uh, be uh, part of the of, of our of our course, or at least uh, only very tangential issue. If ever. All right, so so let me try to describe the outline of uh, our uh, four week course. So there will be. At least uh, my hope is that there will be uh, six chapters. Um, the, the first chapter is about large deviations and a bit of convex analysis. So if you want, it's like a, um, some, some background knowledge, which I, I think is um, possibly useful to understand the sequence. So in fact, you know, strictly speaking, large deviations will only be used tangentially uh, um, in, in, the, in the SQL, but it's a very natural companion to statistical mechanics. And I, I would feel bad to speak uh, during four weeks about statistical mechanics without even mentioning large deviations. So I'm going to be relatively quick on this and, and very informal. You, you, you will find in the handwritten notes, uh, rigorous proofs of the statement I, I care about. So yeah, I hope they are readable enough for you to uh, to parse. But uh, yeah, if if things are a bit are going a bit too fast for you uh, in, in this chapter, um, yeah, it's good to know that large divisions will not be really very useful uh, for the SQL. Okay, so just having some rough understanding of what it is it will be enough. And I think it's also interesting that. It, Already, when you, when you do large deviations, we have this idea of uh, looking for Laplace transforms or you know, something that, you know, the context we could call a free energy. You know, I tend to think of the free energy as some sort of Laplace transform. And when we do large deviations, you know, it's similarly, we, the first thing we try to do is compute the Laplace transform or the free energy, if we want to call it that way. And from that, we deduce large deviations. The, the second chapter, so this will be a very short chapter, maybe even just one session. And yeah, there'll be a bit of convex analysis. I mostly want to single out one result, which is, which is this uh, fanchel moore result about, uh, you know, if you take the, about convex duality. Uh, okay, so if you take the dual of the dual, then you recover the function. And, and then we will turn to the, the Curry-Weiss model. So here I'm going to uh, try to motivate its definition. And also I'm going to explain that using large deviations, you can identify the free energy of this model. Okay, so um, I said large deviations would not be important, but uh, the point is that Curry-Weiss model is so simple that I can use large deviations in order to solve it. So this will be unique to this model. For, for the two other classes of models that we are going to discuss, it will no longer be the case. So we have to devise another uh, proof approach if we want to uh, continue with the next models. So instead of directly going to the more difficult models, I'm going to stick with the curry vice model and try to develop a more robust proof strategy to the identification of the free energy. Okay, so just to recap, uh, for curry vice, because it's so simple, uh, large deviations give us the limit for energy uh, essentially without much effort. Um, but I want to develop a more robust proof strategy for this model. And I will also uh, introduce generalized notion of the curry vice model. Okay, and now I already uh, said it earlier, but the what we're going to do next is focus on on this uh, on this uh, partial differential e equation question of how do we talk about um, solutions to the equation I displayed earlier, the 
the equation which is displayed now here. How do we talk about existence and uniqueness of solutions? So we spend some time talking about this equation. And we will see them arising very naturally from the Curie-Weiss model. So, so it will be, you know, the, the, this name is, is viscosity solutions because there's something called the viscosity here. And in fact, the Curie-Weiss model is so nice that it even comes with this extra small viscosity uh, before we pass to the limit. So it's, you know, from the Curie-Weiss models to thinking about the viscosity solutions to Hamilton-Jacobi equations, it's really, it's really very, very natural. And then we will uh, develop the theory for this. And in particular, we will focus on uniqueness questions uh, for the equation. So I will focus a bit less on existence questions because for us, exist existence will be coming uh, essentially for free because we are trying to show that something converges to the solution. So we're not going to be lacking candidates. The problem is just to show that there's a unique possible limit point. But the existence of a limit point uh, will not be an issue. Okay, so, uh, in, in general, yeah, the thing I most care about is how do we say there is a unique solution to this point, to this equation? Okay, so that will be the, the third chapter. Uh, yeah, I, I skipped a question in the chat, but I find it quite advanced, so I, I'm, I'm a bit, uh, yeah, sorry, I, I, maybe we can keep this to the to the conversation later. Then, then the fourth chapter uh, is going to be so coming back to oops to generalized uh, Curie Weiss models. Oh yes, and I should I should have said in, in chapter three we will also uh, solve the Curie Weiss model using this. Hamilton Jacobi equation techniques. But in the fourth chapter, next we will try to use this same approach for generalized Curie Weiss models. And here we will find some surprises. So, um, so for a very long time, I was very puzzled by this, especially because I was facing these surprises for, for spin glasses, and it took me a very long time to realize that I could mimic these surprises uh, on these simpler models. And they are very, I mean, when you see them at first, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's hard to explain at our current stage, but it seems that the, for, for generalized model, it seems that the, the, the thing that makes viscosity solutions work is coming upside down in, in some sense, which uh, okay, for those who perhaps uh, know in advance what, uh, you know, what viscosity solutions are, typically you introduce uh, a small parameter times a Laplacian um, to, to build the approximation. And then you, you let this small parameter tend to zero and you say the limit is the solution. And you know, the way we define hamilton jacobi equations it is crucial that the limit is, uh, yes, uh, that the limit is uh, plus Laplacian. You know, it's a positive parameter which goes to zero times Laplacian because you use the maximum principle to, to perform the arguments. But in fact, for generalized Curie-Weiss models, sometimes it seems that to come with a minus sign. And this is just, uh, I think it should, it should ring alarm bells uh, if, uh, if we understand what viscosity solutions are because the maximum principle will be just upside down if the if the Laplacian has a minus sign in front. So okay. If what I just said does not make sense to you, no worries, uh, this will be clarified later. So we will have this surprise and we will see how to overcome this, this surprise uh, later. So so we will identify a new technique to identify uh, the viscosity solution to some equation. And the, you know, the mystery will, will, will rely on the fact that the functions we care about are convex uh, of functions of their parameters. So 
I don't say more uh, about this, but uh, this will be really the, the key new ingredient that, in fact, convexity on its own uh, can act as some sort of selection principle for uh, pinpointing the viscosity solution. And so, okay, I, when, when we reach chapter four, I will make a, a clearer sense of this, what I just said. And we'll see that once we have this, uh, generalized pluribus models also uh, uh, are solved easily. And therefore we recover what we knew in advance from large deviations, but using this other proof approach. And once we have uh, struggled through these four first chapters, it's time to reap the fruits of our efforts. So, so then we, we go to statistical inference. And here, so you know, this is the model with this X bar, X bar transpose of which we observe a noisy version and we try to recover X bar, X bar transpose. And what would be very nice here is that uh, all of the hard work is already contained in the previous chapters so when we, uh, when, when we write down what it is that we want to show for this problem, you know, how to speak about this information theoretic, theoretic limits of you know, how can we recover the signal, et cetera. Once we identify the correct definitions and the correct analog of the free energy, all of the hard work has already been done and we can uh, add, conclude for, for the, the questions we, we care about here. Okay, so uh, if, if some of you have, um, have looked into what I talked about in the OOPS summer school of, uh, of last year, I, I mentioned this problem as well. And there I used a different uh, proof strategy, one which is not based on viscosity solutions. And the main point of this uh, new approach I'm going to explain here is that this one extends to uh, also to generalize versions of this statistical inference problem, unlike the previous approach I, I had described. So for instance, if you want to do, you know, when you do X bar, X bar transpose, it's something of order two, but maybe you want to do, you, you could imagine situations where you observe something of order three, you know, for instance, X bar, X bar I, X bar J, X bar K, and maybe instead of something of rank one, you would have something of higher rank, et cetera. So anyway, you can cook up many generalizations. And the, the, the main advantage of the proof strategy uh, that is presented here is that it covers also these generalized models. And I should say that this, so this rests on this selection principle that we will talk about in chapter four. And this is joint work with uh, Hongbin uh, Chen. And Jiaming Sha. Oops, sorry. Jiaming. Yeah. Okay, and um, another advantage of this uh, proof approach is that also contrary to the one I explained last year, uh, it has a chance to work for spin glasses. So it's not yet working really, but uh, at least uh, uh, at least uh, we can go further. And uh, and this is what I hope to explain in the last chapter of this course. So which will be on spin glasses. So, so here, as I said several times, um, the results are less complete, but still uh, we can say some things. Um, so, so in fact, I, I lied a little bit uh, when I say that this, this equation here describes uh, both, uh, you know, or maybe all of uh, you know, the curie vice model, the statistical inference, and the SK model is not quite true because in fact, for the SK model, you have to, so this, this variable X, it was a, a real variable. It has to be replaced by a probability measure for, for this thing, for the SK model.
So in other words, now the solution is going to be, let's say f of t and mu. So t is t in R plus, but the mu, it will be a probability measure on, on the non-negative half line. And so you see that it becomes a little bit uh, more complex because the, the equation becomes infinite dimensional. If you want to describe a probability measure, you have to supply, a, I mean, it's not really a vector space, but, uh, but the, the intrinsic dimension is infinite. So things will be more complicated. And um, yeah, so far this is still uh, even research in progress. But what I hope to achieve is to first give you um, actually a, a complete description of the fact that the, the free energy satisfies uh, the, the relevant equation in some approximate sense. Okay, so, so we will see that the, the finite dimensional, the, the finite volume, the finite n free energy essentially solves the relevant equation up to some error. Which, okay, uh, then I have to wave my hands uh, to say that uh, it's small. Okay, so at least we will do this derivation of the approximate equation uh, completely. And then I will state without proof the, 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 the bound that I have uh, so far, which is relating the, the limit of the free energy with the solution of this equation. And uh, yeah, as a, as a final note, um, I also would like to say that as far as I understand, so, so here we will have some, some conjecture for what the, okay, I should say, I already uh, said early that uh, for the SK model, we know the free energy in terms of the limit free energy in terms of this uh, biational formula, you know, this inf over probability measures, et cetera. And through our study of hamilton jacobi equations, we will see that when, when the, when the nonlinearity in the equation is convex, like it's here, like, so this is the square function, the nonlinearity, we can always write the, the solution in, in some biational form. So, so here, we can recover the Pisi formula from this uh, from this equation using this connection. You know, so solution to an equation with a convex nonlinearity uh, maps to a biational formula. But for the bipartite case, and that's really you know the the the, the boundary between models we understand and models we do not understand. So for the bipartite case and all, all these other models we do not understand the nonlinearity in the equation is not convex. In fact. And so in this case, as far as I understand, in fact, there is no variational formula for the, for the limit free energy. So as far as I understand, in fact, the only uh, conje possible conjecture you can make for the bipartite model is phrased in terms of this equation, which I have not completely described yet. But, and just to give you a hint of, uh, for the bipartite case, what the equation looks like. So for the bipartite case, it's perhaps not very surprising that we will have to use two variables instead of one. And so the equation we, for the bipartite case, we look sort of like this. So, so we will have two variables, maybe I can call them x1 and x2. Oops. So you see that this, instead of having this derivative squared, it will be split into these two uh, things. And uh, because pink glasses are what they are, again, we will have to replace these variables by, by priority measures. Okay, so then it becomes a relatively uh, more difficult to talk about, but, uh, but still with a short description. All right. Oh yeah. So another thing. Uh, so so that that's the the end of my description of the outline of the class. One other thing I wanted to say is that um, there is material I prepared for the class that you you can find uh, on the website of the of the of the summer school or on my personal website. This you already know, 
but it's I think I want to stress now that I I prepared probably too much material for for the class and you have to be aware of this okay so for instance for large deviations my notes are you know have uh, rigorous proofs etc but tomorrow probably I will uh, I will only be relatively sketchy about the arguments and and similarly perhaps more importantly the thing I wanted to stress is that I prepared lots of exercises and some of them are quite hard and there are lots of them so if you do not manage to uh, solve you know I'd not I did not write them in order for you to solve them all. Okay, I, I, maybe it's, it's interesting for you to read all of the sta question statements, but uh, I think it's beyond anyone's uh, uh, abilities to solve all of the problems. Uh, at least uh, that would be my guess. There are really many problems. So uh, rest reassured uh, if you find that there are too many problems or if you find that they are hard. And if you want to uh, do something to prepare for, for tomorrow, I would suggest to have a look at the handwritten notes of uh, chapter one on, on large deviations. And possibly also, if you want to think about the, the first exercise of the problem set, of the first problem set, that would also be nice. Uh, but yeah, I'll let you decide on this. Um, are, are there questions uh, on what I just discussed? I mean, what I discussed uh, uh, over like today, not just uh, in the last time. Yeah, so if you, let's say that for now, uh, have, try to read uh, chapter one and, and do the first problem of, of the first problem set. Just to answer one question in the chat. Oh, okay, yeah, so uh, thanks, uh, Jean Christophe, for a, for a great uh, start for the school. Um, Sorry, so yeah. thanks a lot. and. Uh, I guess, uh, yeah, see you tomorrow. Um, so, so I uh, I don't propose, this is Luigi speaking, I still have Jean-Christophe's image pinned. I'm going to uh, stop the recording for now um, and uh, the live stream and I'll resume them in a little under half an hour when my course starts.